In this research methods and psychology video, we're going to cover the use of case studies. We'll discuss what's included in the definition of a case study and describe a few examples of famous case studies. The strengths and weaknesses of using a case study in psychological research will also be covered. Psychboost.com, over 170 videos to help you with your qualification, and Patreon supporters can access bonus resources, tutorial videos, and the Discord channel. In a case study, a researcher gathers a range of information on an individual, a group, or an organisation. Interviews are often the main source of data collected, but the researcher can include observations of behaviour, and even experimental findings from psychological tests. And even include content analysis on records like diaries. Now, what makes case studies special is the level of detail that's collected about the individual or the group. Case studies tend to be investigations of psychologically unusual individuals. But you can do case studies of events, such as looking for the reasons for football violence by reviewing footage and interviewing criminals and police. Or you could do case studies on organisations, such as the hiring policies of Google, or the teaching at outstanding schools. You may even do a case study on a group of typical members of a demographic, like a group of 15-year-old working class boys. The type of data collected is usually qualitative, information in the form of words, because of the use of interviews. But when the researchers include experimental techniques, quantitative data, data in the form of numbers, can be used to back up qualitative findings. The duration of a case study can be a couple of hours, a few days, or years to decades. A short case study is called a snapshot, and a long case study is called a longitudinal study. Now, longitudinal studies are particularly interesting because you can observe changes over time. But as you can imagine, it's expensive to keep longitudinal studies funded over many, many years. Case studies have been used significantly in clinical psychology. Brain damaged patients often have unusual symptoms, and this gives an insight on the functioning of the brain. Now, for example, Paul Broca researched a patient referred to as Tan. Now, this patient could only say Tan, and work while Tan was alive was combined with post-mortem dissection of his brain after his death. And this work led to the identification of Broca's area, a part of the brain responsible for speech production. Freud used a number of case studies to develop psychodynamics, and the most famous was Little Hands. This young boy had a phobia of horses that Freud identified as being symbolic of his fear of his father. And Freud conducted this case study by sending a series of letters to his father, and used this case study to support his theory of childhood development. Case studies of children with abnormal upbringings can be used to test the ideas of childhood development. And one famous example is the case of a child called Jeannie, who was severely deprived of care from infancy until 13. Now, even with the help of trained psychologists, she was unable to develop beyond simple communication and struggled to behave appropriately. Jeannie demonstrated the importance of early years and critical periods of childhood in learning language and social skills. Evaluations of case studies. We can positively evaluate case studies easily. There just isn't another method that collects as much in-depth and rich information about individuals. This leads to a high level of realism that can be argued to be highly valid. Psychologists call this approach holistic, understanding a behaviour or individual not just from one perspective but from a range. It's the preferred approach of a group of psychologists called the humanists. As I've said, case studies often look at the behaviour of very rare individuals. This behaviour and the participant situations can't be replicated in the lab. Jeannie's situation, for example, can never be ethically replicated. And this means that case studies are often the only way to study certain behaviours. And another strength is just one unusual case study can show a pre-existing psychological theory is incorrect, or maybe just not yet complete. But there are critical evaluations of case studies. Most of these critical evaluations question the scientific nature of case studies. For example, case studies are often completed long after events and depend heavily on memory. So what's recorded in interviews is often inaccurate. And you have the other problems of interviews like social desirability bias. Being studies of often one unique individual, the findings from case studies cannot be generalised to wider populations. It might be a range of factors of that individual that cause a certain behaviour, rather than, for example, damage to a particular part of the brain. Now, linked to this point is the exact replication of case studies is impossible. And while the amount of data collected is large, this presents another problem. Sometimes more data is collected than can actually be used. And the researcher ultimately decides what to include in the report, and might only include data that supports their ideas. Now, this is one example of researcher bias. Another way case studies suffer from researcher bias is as the researchers work so closely with a case, 
often over many years, they may lose objectivity when interpreting behaviour. And while case studies shouldn't be generalised, and lack the scientific credibility of experimental methods, they can generate hypotheses that can be tested empirically and then ultimately accepted. Well over a hundred years after Paul Broca and Tan's death, we now can use fMRI scans to confirm the existence of the region of the brain associated with speech production. So that was case studies. I have six tutorial videos covering the 2017, 18 and 19 AS and A-level research method sections. And these videos have worked examples to every question and are full of exam tips. Patrons at the neural level and above can access these and many, many more hours of exam tutorial videos, as well as over 100 printable resources from across the A-level over on psychboost.com. I do want to thank all the students and teachers who've supported Psychboost over on Patreon during the development of the Research Methods Unit. It's their support that allows me to teach part-time so I can make Psychboost on YouTube for everyone. So thanks to them, and I'll see you in the next Research Methods video, Aims and Hypotheses.